Welcome again. Today we continue with section 4, Biodiversity, looking at 4.1.5. Explain the relationships among ecosystem stability, diversity, succession, and habitat. And as we make our way through this specific topic, we look at it with the spider's web in the background because it is one of those topics which links to different parts of the environmental systems and societies course. It links section 2, the ecosystem, with section 4, biodiversity, and it also links with section 5, pollution issues, and there are always links with section 7, value systems. As we continue to make our way through the course, these connections will become more and more significant. Ultimately, we will realize that all topics in environmental systems and societies are connected and the course itself is not meant to be studied or examined as topics in isolation, but the entire course represents one integrated environmental system and how it impacts with society and how society impacts it. Lichens growing on bare rock. Together with the abiotic factors, lichens eventually work their way into the rock, creating a small platform of soil that allows ferns to become established. This process eventually leads to an even thicker, richer soil that allows trees and other plants to establish themselves. These trees take a long time, sometimes over a hundred years, to eventually give rise to the climax community. Biodiversity reaches a peak at that point, and soil depth reaches a peak at that point. And it's for all of these reasons that we term this stage of succession the climax stage. The period of most growth is the stage just before the climax stage, when you have a young forest growing. That's the forest that's taking more carbon dioxide out of the air and locking it away in more plant tissue. That's the forest that's acting as a better sink for taking up carbon dioxide out of the air. The rainforest habitat. The stream flowing through the rainforest. Just one part of the habitat. You can see that there are a lot of moss growing on these rocks and some shrubs growing here along the banks of the stream. And if we went up into the canopy, then we would find that there is even more biodiversity in this part of the forest. The canopy is one of the most biodiverse areas on the planet, with lots of different species making their home in the canopy. Even in one of these little epiphytic bromeliads, you can find lots of different microorganisms making their home in the water that's trapped by the bromeliad and even frogs laying eggs in these areas and having tadpoles hatch back to the floor of the rainforest. Within this one area, you can have a lot of diversity of habitat, a lot of diversity of ecological niches. And this is just the one component of the overall thing that is biodiversity. An important question is, how does a more diverse habitat allow for more genetic diversity? It's clear that the more niches you have, the more species can come into the habitat and occupy different positions. For instance, frogs living in bromeliads, plants living on the floor, earthworms, invertebrates, a range of organisms of different species 
But an important question is, how does habitat diversity contribute to genetic diversity within a given species population. Here we have a picture of the plantain squirrel. A population of these squirrels has the ability to occupy a very diverse niche with these squirrels not specializing in one type of food within their habitat. Here you can see one squirrel actually feeding on the bark of this tree, but the plantain squirrels also consume lots of fruit and also lots of invertebrates. So with this ability to feed in different parts of the habitat, if the habitat is able to provide more variety then some individuals would be able to specialize a bit more in certain kinds of feeding and within that population if there are other individuals that are better suited to feeding on invertebrates or fruit or bark whatever their preference as an individual within the population their chances of surviving in the struggle for existence within their own population and within their environment would be increased and as a result the squirrel population would have more variety in its gene pool and it is in this way that a more diverse habitat allows for more genetic variation to be sustained within a given population. A more diverse habitat opens a wider niche for each species and this allows for more genetic variation within the species population. Diverse and complex habitats or ecosystems also have many energy pathways. As this picture shows, the layer at the top of a forest, the emergent layer, those trees that project above the thick canopy provide the first layer of productivity within the ecosystem. But there are several areas where energy can enter. The areas lower down which are also capable of generating some productivity, making use of whatever light penetrates down through the canopy. And we also have plants on the forest floor doing some uh, productivity and bringing energy into the system. Once the energy enters, then complex ecosystems have diverse food webs. Higher level consumers like the ocelot or the snake here would have several sources of food that they can utilize so that their flow of energy through the system isn't dependent upon the one source. If some event happens that removes that source, an event like a disease or a natural disaster, then it would not spell catastrophe for the entire system because organisms feed at multiple levels or on a variety of sources. The more mature an area is in terms of its succession, the more likely it is to have more biodiversity, deeper soil, and more complex feeding relationships or food webs. Nutrient pathways which come up from the soil bringing nutrients into the producers and then ultimately into the consumers. Those two are more complicated when ecosystems are in the advanced stages of succession. Complex ecosystems have multiple nutrient pathways.
the sound of a chainsaw. Human intervention in ecosystems often compromises or seriously affects the complexity and diversity within the system. Human-induced events like logging, hunting, fires, floods caused by human activities, food webs are changed, ecological niches are destroyed, soil quality changes, air quality changes. Sometimes large sections of the habitat are completely lost and irreversibly transformed. Agriculture is one such human activity that greatly simplifies the diversity of an ecosystem. A climax rainforest that has been modified and converted into oil palm plantation. While you have significant biodiversity in the oil palm plantation, it is very little when compared to the rich biodiversity of the rainforest. Biodiversity in a wild area of grassland. Compare this to a farmland that's been modified to cultivate wheat, per se, or corn. Some habitats are affected more than other habitats by human intervention. Habitats are affected in different ways by human intervention. Consider here a rainforest and a grassland. Tropical rainforest has high diversity and if it experiences human intervention such as hunting, it's very likely that if kept to a minimum, the ecosystem would be able to tolerate with its great diversity this level of intervention and it would be able to recover from this level of intervention. If however the forests were subjected to massive clearing and fires a more catastrophic type intervention, then it may lack the ability to rebound from this kind of intervention. Whereas the grassland, on the other hand, does not have the same level of biodiversity as the rainforest. But if a fire sweeps through a grassland, it could fairly easily when compared to the rainforest rebound from this seemingly catastrophic occurrence. In comparing the two environments, the rainforest and the grassland, we say, we say that the resilience of the grassland is far greater than the resilience of the rainforest because Grasslands have the ability to rebound fairly quickly after events like fires, whereas the rainforest would find it very difficult and it would take a long time to recover from such interference. So we use the term resilience to describe the ability of a system to recover cover or to rebound after a major disturbance.
If disturbances are small, then rainforests are able to tolerate this kind of interference. So we say that if a system has some resistance to being altered, then we say it has a high level of inertia. And with the variety of energy and decomposer pathways and the complex food webs, rainforests can be described as having high inertia. And finally, because of the high diversity of rainforest, this factor also contributes to its inertia. As we end today's lesson, I would like you to make a list of human activities that affect ecosystems. Include at least five activities in your list, and then analyze the effects of each activity on the stability of the ecosystem. This background picture was selected for one reason that's fairly obvious, but there's another reason that goes beyond the mere domino. That reason has to do with elephants, and that will become part of our discussion in section 4.2.